Okay. Good morning, good uh, afternoon, good evening. This is Louis Jovell from Australia, and we're bringing uh, a special um, uh, notas theologicas or theological notes today, uh, and this involves Dr. Paul Copan from uh, Florida in the United States. So we only we don't only have uh, Jose as, as as our American um, friend. We also have uh, another one <laughs> now, <laughs> and and today we're going to be talking about uh, about what he does. And um, what, what he's working, and um, instead of me telling you, or well, what I would like to tell you first is that he has a lot of a lot of books. I, I started going on Amazon just to see how many books you had, and I had some books. Uh, li li like to show you, to, to, so you know that it's true. I have some, I have some of your books. <laughs> uh, um, that's your interpretation, true, true for you, not for me. And contending with Christian critics as well, which is I, I like this one. You you edited, so you have edited over over thirty books, and written written and edited over thirty books. So so I'm very glad that that you have accepted uh, this invitation to be with us. Uh, this will be um, later. This will be um, subtitle in Spanish, so our Spanish uh, audience can also have a taste of what we are, uh, what, what what we we're, we're talking about here. So. So, Paul, uh, can, uh, can can you start by by um, introducing yourself and telling telling us a bit of your background, please? Sure. Uh, well, I uh, grew up in a in a pastor's home, a uh, family of seven children, and mm -hmm. my father was uh, born in the Ukraine. My mother from Latvia. They met after the Second World War in uh, in Germany. Um, and then came over to the United States. My dad, you know, they got married, and my dad uh, enrolled in seminary. And uh, and uh, I was born in Cleveland, Ohio, where my dad was pastor of a Russian-Ukrainian uh, Baptist church. And so grew up in, in that uh, subculture. And uh, I, you know, in high school, I went to a Christian uh, high school, mostly public schools early on, and then a, a Christian private high school. And there I became exposed to apologetics for the first time, mm. uh, which was very helpful for me. And then I went to Columbia International University and got an undergrad in biblical studies and always sensed that I would be involved in some sort of ministry work. And so I went on to uh, get a Master of Divinity uh, at Trinity Seminary, and while I was pursuing my Master of Divinity, I took a philosophy class with uh, Stuart Hackett, who had been a uh, mentor and uh, one who strongly influenced William Lane Craig, the philosopher, Christian philosopher. And so I took a course with him, and uh, and of course um, William Craig, William Craig also happened to be teaching there, and so I took classes from him as well. So I got a double masters, one in divinity, one in one in uh, philosophy of religion, and so uh, so I, I went on staff. I, I met my wife in the Chicago area where I was going to Trinity, and. Um, uh, we were married, and then I went on staff with the church in upstate New York for six and a half years, and I found that having a degree in philosophy uh, was very useful, especially as I was a volunteer staff worker for InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, mm -hmm. which works on Christian university campuses, uh, or sorry, works on university campuses. And so I, uh, so I uh, found that having a background in philosophy just connected with people. It was just a good platform to have a door for the gospel. So uh, so my wife and I were talking about well, what, what would be the next step to take, and we'd always been thinking about missionary work overseas, and, and she said, well, what about getting a PhD? And uh, she was thinking theology, I was thinking mm -hmm. philosophy, and so, uh, so I said, yeah, that's great. And of course, we had four children, four and under at the time, uh, but uh, ended up going to, uh, to Marquette University in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, mm -hmm. And so got my PhD there and then worked with Ravi Zacharias International Ministries for five years or so. Uh, and uh, then in 2004, came down here to, uh, to as the Pledger Family Chair of Philosophy and Ethics at Palm Beach Atlantic University. So I've been here since then and uh, have really enjoyed uh, the work that I do and uh, been blessed to uh, do work in the area of biblical studies and theology and, uh, and philosophy and trying to bring uh, some of these areas together for uh, for elucidating uh, various questions that come up that uh, where these disciplines intersect and so so yeah i've been thrilled to be here and uh, glad to be down here in in florida at this time for the uh, for teaching at palm beach Atlantic university 
Would you consider yourself a Floridian by now? <laughs> Not quite. I love. I, I was. I lived. My wife is from New England. Oh, uh, yeah, she's cool. from the Boston area, and I, I spent a lot of time in Connecticut. So we really love that part of the country. So, uh, so not Floridians, but uh, we've 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 had to make some adjustments, but it's been okay. No, oh, it's uh, so. It's, uh, uh, maybe Jose has a question on this regard. Yes. Um, yeah, um, I've I've noticed that. Um, well, you you you've been uh, you've been busy all these years, uh, Dr. Copan. I. I I'm really impressed with uh, the work that you've done through the years, um, and and one of the reasons why why I thought that this uh, this uh, interview with you would be really beneficial is because uh, at this time you know the only name you hear with, uh, out there is uh, say uh, William Lane Craig is the first one that you hear in Latin America. Um, well, we wanna we wanna open our audience to other other philosophers and. Uh, I think that you're you're one of the you're one of the the people that that you know it, it we would benefit from from learning and hearing from you and getting to know you mm. that way we can have a a, a different understanding uh, and as Louis said there's there's there there's a there's a mentality and a uh, and a lot of people that we that we meet that um, okay so so we we we're gonna focus on one area. Uh, and um, and and this is the best area to focus, and we're gonna put all uh, all our eggs in one mm. Oh, he's 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 a kike. <laughs> oh, look, look. <laughs> Hopefully, he comes back. Can yeah, it's a little slow. It's a little slow. It, 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 it's a. So I, I hope I hope he realizes what's going on. I think he's coming back. Can do. Uh, you, okay. Did, did you? Did I lose? Yes, you lost. Did I lose myself? Down a little bit. It was hard to. I, li I like you know, how you, I, I like how you stop with your you, with your with your tongue outside. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyways, so I don't know if if you heard what I said, but. Um, uh, yeah, we we just want it. We want people to uh, to get to know you and and have other perspectives, not mm -hmm. only one one uh, one philosopher out there, uh, yeah. which um, um, I think is always good uh, because we can hear other perspectives and learn from from other teachers. Yeah, and uh, uh, the second question we have for you, Doctor. Uh, Copen is, uh, well, it's kind of a, a two a two part. Uh, would you tell us who is your favorite philosopher and your favorite theologian? Okay. Well, favorite philosopher is Jesus, mm -hmm. um, but uh, that's probably uh, one that you already take for granted. Um, you know, of course, the wisest and most intelligent man who ever walked the earth. Uh, but in terms of uh, just philosophers, I uh, I do. Uh, into, oh, an ancient philosopher I like is Augustine, um, who used philosophy well. Uh, he uh, was influenced by Ambrose, uh, a Neoplatonist, uh, influenced uh, Christian philosopher. And uh, it was through this philosophical input as he wrestled with the problem of evil, as he wrestled with uh, the you know, how could he make sense of God as a spiritual substance, uh, that he found uh, much that Ambrose gave to him very helpful. Uh, but in terms of a modern philosopher, I'd say Alvin Plantinga. He has been a uh, a leading uh, philosopher. Of course, he's uh, he's uh, had he's already you know, had a significant career in influencing and uh, and writing and so forth. But uh, but I appreciated the fact that he when he stepped in uh, to his philosophical career, he was an, he was unafraid in challenging uh, naturalism and challenging. Uh, this what's called verificationism. That in order to believe something, in order to know something, you have to uh, be able to verify it. And of course, he challenged that by saying, "You can't verify that very statement." Um, and uh, <laughs> mm. and you know, he seemed, you know, he's just unafraid and challenging what I think a lot of people were afraid to say. Uh, they wanted to just fit into what the mentality uh, of the day was during what was called logical positivism's uh, heyday. 
Um, and uh, he led the way for many people. Uh, he started the Society for uh, Christian Society of Christian Philosophers. Uh, he he's also one who has uh, when he writes, he writes with great humor. He's uh, he's uh, very engaging. Uh, he doesn't do dry philosophy. He does very uh, very lively uh, philosophy. I mean, he's a rigorous thinker. Um, but uh, but I also appreciate the fact that he is uh, is is gracious. Uh, that he's someone who's very been very personable. Uh, I've had the pleasure to uh, to know him, to interact with him, and so forth. Uh, and uh, just has been uh, one who, whom I've uh, highly respected. Uh, so uh, so that's uh, in terms of philosophy. I would say uh, Alan Plantinga. Uh, in terms of um, uh, theologians, I think a, a model theologian for me has been, I mean, to talk about, say, contemporaries, I, I mean, I, somebody I like is Kevin Van Hooser mm. uh, at Trinity Seminary. He had been a professor of mine uh, when I was uh, when I was there back in the late 80s, in, in the mid 80s. But um, uh, but I'd say someone who's been a real model for me has been Jonathan Edwards, uh, philosopher, mm. theologian, uh, 1703 to 1758, uh, lived in uh, New England and uh, also was uh, uh, president at uh, uh, Princeton um, University, a uh, short t- time there, but but I've appreciated him as a role model for you know being a pastor. Uh, of course, he you know and is also a missionary. Uh, is a very rigorous thinker, though someone who engaged uh, philosophically, uh, but also sought to do theology and philosophy to the glory of God. He was someone who was consumed with the glory of God and. Mm. And uh, and and use philosophical resources to uh, assist in the theological task. And so, just for a number of reasons, I've uh, appreciated the work of uh, of Jonathan Edwards, his keenness of mind, his uh, spiritual devotion, uh, his ability to be creative uh, theologically. Uh, so, so I would say uh, Jonathan Edwards has been a real role model for me. It's, it's, it's very interesting because uh, here in Australia, you know, I don't know if you're aware that uh, Ridley. They have a Jonathan Edwards Center because mm-hmm. uh, it's a big it's a big um, Riz Bassan who's the history the history teacher there. Uh, see history mm-hmm. lecturer. He, he lectured me as well. Um, he majoring in Jonathan Edwards, so it's very strong. And I, and I like that what you said first that Jesus, uh, your favorite philosopher, would be Jesus because people don't tend to see Jesus as a philosopher. Um, mm-hmm. He, they, they just tend to see him as a religious leader, but he was a philosopher. Uh, we can we can say how to live. I mean, uh, uh, mm-hmm. on ethics, uh, mm-hmm. people don't tend to see Jesus as an ethical philosopher, and which which he 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 was and he is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I wrote a book called uh, "A Little Book for New Philosophers," mm-hmm. and uh, and uh, the uh, theologian N. T. Wright said that uh, you know Jesus as well as the Apostle Paul. Would have been considered philosophers in the uh, in the Mediterranean world at that mm. time. That they were, in, you know, of course, um, Jesus uh, spoke in terms of metaphysics and epistemology, the study of knowledge and uh, and uh, and ethics, as you said. And um, and there again, Doctor Copan, those are the issues in our Latin American community. Once you in some in some circles, which is a big circles, if you mention the word metaphysics. That that creates uh, cheaters to people because 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 uh, some teachers have told that that's wrong and I said well metaphysics is what you see uh, um, and, and 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 that's why uh, like Jose said we like to introduce uh, our uh, the Spanish speaking culture the Spanish speaking church Latin American church that you are not you, you cannot you don't have to be afraid of philosophy <laughs> you don't have to be afraid yeah. of all these terms. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, you can you can tell them you know, that everyone is a philosopher. Everyone has a view of reality, which is metaphysics. We believe in the reality of certain things, whether it be just a material world or a material and spiritual world. Uh, that's metaphysics. Mm-hmm. Uh, we all have a way of, you know, we believe that we can know through certain pathways uh, that we can know, or some people say we can't know. Well, that's, a, that's taking a view about epistemology or the study mm-hmm. of knowledge. Uh, we all have take a stance on right and wrong. Some people say there is no such thing as right and wrong. Well, you're still taking a stance, a philosophical stance, mm. 
on the on the matter of ethics. So uh, these are inescapable areas. Uh, we are inescapably philosophers. Yes. Uh, and everyone has a worldview. Everyone has a philosophy of life. Uh, and the question is, how do you justify your philosophy of life? How do you uh, how do you sustain that? How do you support that? Which worldview makes the best sense of the way things are uh, really are? Mm. So, uh, yes, Jose, you want to add something? Or? No, 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 go ahead. Yes, uh, the, our next question would be, uh, what is apologetics and why the need for apologetics? Um, okay. I think for a Christian, main, main, mainly, uh, why we need and what it is, what is it? <laughs> okay, sure, sure. Well, you, there are a couple of diff different definitions that we could uh, appeal to. I think a, a common one that people will uh, refer to is uh, it's uh, de a defense of the Christian faith. Uh, I like to put it a little bit more uh, in a more nuanced way. It's the art and science of mm. defending the Christian faith. Mm. Um, yeah, there's a there's a you know, yes, there's a science. I think that's what people mostly understand uh, that there are public reasons, uh, accessible reasons, uh, objective reasons for the Christian faith. You know, we can we appeal to to argument, to historical evidences, and so forth to support the Christian faith. But but there's also an, an art uh, to mm. the uh, to doing apologetics. Uh, there's the relational component. Uh, you know, we want to know. Who, with whom we are dealing, uh, with who, to whom we're relating. Uh, so there's a relational component. Um, what, what, where is this person coming from? How did he come to believe the things that he or she has? Um, there's a requirement of discerning what the person's needs are. He may be giving you some uh, an argument uh, against God uh, from evil. And the real issue may be that uh, that there are some deeper, uh, deeper felt needs that he himself is not addressing. Uh, maybe there's been a broken relationship with a father. It's it's very interesting that uh, many of the world's leading atheists. Yes, you have a have chapter one of your books. <laughs> yeah, have I've had read negative that. Wow. existent relationships with their own fathers, and so uh, so I think so often we we think that the all that needs to be addressed is the intellectual dimension, but mm. we forget about the personal. We forget about the. Uh, you know some of the deep emotional uh, areas, the psychological uh, dimensions, and also people need love. People don't just need answers. People need to know that they're appreciated, and uh, we need to display the love of God as we engage uh, with other people. So, so there's a host of uh, of things that could be said here when it comes to the art of defending the Christian faith. Uh, but I think just at a very basic level, being a good listener. We need to be, as mm. James says, quick to listen and slow to speak. And we as Christians often reverse those. We're very quick yes. to speak and very slow to listen. Um, so so engaging in apologetics, it's the art and science of defending the Christian faith. But uh, but I think that, you know, as Dallas Willard said, uh, apologetics is fundamentally the task of doubt removal uh, it, to help both the believer and the unbeliever remove doubts in order to enter into either deeper discipleship or just plain old discipleship, uh, being a follower of Jesus Christ. Uh, so removing those areas of doubts, and uh, Dallas Willard speaks of that in terms of just relating to people, sitting down and finding out what the source of their doubt is. Uh, and uh, we have, uh, yeah, and, and so, uh, so there's need for apologetics within the church, because a lot of believers have doubts. In fact, uh, one theologian, uh, Avery Dulles, said that there's a there's an infidel inside of each believer. <laughs> uh, that there's an unbeliever yeah. inside of each of us. Uh, Ask Dulles was great. Yeah. Dulles was great. Uh, Doctor Doctor Copen. Um, so um, we we we've done a we've done a few uh, a few programs on on apologetics, and what we point out is that well the 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 main reason why we do apologetics is because we want to get uh, to the gospel. We want mm -hmm. to share uh, the gospel to people, mm -hmm. and there are you know some ap apologists who are enthusiasts that uh, you know they do a lot of apologetics, but uh, you know they uh, that's all they do. They never get to uh, the reason le uh, raison d'être. Mm -hmm. <laughs> of apologetics. Uh, so what yeah. would you say to that? Yeah, well, as, as I was just saying, Mia, um, you know, with regard to uh, Dallas Willard, he said we need to be helping people either move to discipleship if they're unbelievers and to move into deeper discipleship if they're believers. So it's all gospel related. And so our, our apologetic isn't an end in itself. 
Mm -hmm. uh, it is something that uh, helps us to uh, either draw near to God uh, through having our questions answered and having them answered in the right way, uh, or to have some of those uh, doubts that we've been struggling with as believers uh, removed so that we can be freed up to enter more fully into the life that God has for us, uh, living under the gospel. Uh, so, so I think that uh, you're right to, uh, to point out that apologetics is not uh, beating people up for Jesus. Uh, apologetics is, uh, is uh, ultimately, uh, or should be, gospel-centered, gospel-focused. It should have evangelism. Uh, as a, as uh, you know, at least when you're talking with unbelievers, um, it should have evangelism as a, uh, you know, a a fundamental goal. We want to defend the gospel before outsiders, so that they too may worship Jesus as we worship Him. Uh, yeah. That uh, that oftentimes people uh, who engage in apologetics have a very uh, pugnacious, uh, a very um, you know, kind of a fighting spirit. Uh, that they they just want to win arguments, and uh, that's uh, that's not going about things in in a, in a Jesus centered way. Uh, we, we may win an intellectual battle, but lose a person, and so we need to be careful mm, about yes. how we undertake uh, our conversations with unbelievers. Uh, we um, a lot of people they like to get into uh, giving a reason for the hope that lies within them, as First Peter three fifteen says, but they don't do so with gentleness and respect, and that is a very critical. Uh, component as we engage in apologetics. There's a relational dimension that, is, as I've emphasized, and, and I, I like, I enjoy your past pastoral approach, uh, uh, Doctor Copeland. Uh, I, in this thing about winning arguments, um, going back to our our our, um, our Latin American setting, the last ten, fifteen years, uh, there has been a revival of Calvinism within our mm -hmm. ranks. Even I had my my stage my my cage stage of Calvinism myself, um, and and they were using Calvinism in order to answer all the all, all the opposition or all the questions from from Christian from 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 the, um, that they pose against Christianity. And now that apologetics is, is picking up, and, and actually one of your books, along with Doctor uh, William Lane Craig, uh, Ex Nihilo. It's been. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's gonna be uh, uh, very. Um, it's gonna be published soon. If not, it has been published already. In Spanish, yeah, it has. It's published already. Yes. Yes. It's published, yes. Yeah. So. So. Um, so people are are, are are picking up now with apologetics, and now they are using apologetics as they used to use uh, Calvinism in order to. So they're going into this uh, apologetics cage stage. <laughs> <laughs> that everybody yeah. is using, uh, and, and and I think that, like like you said, it's not you can do a well apolog apologetic uh, argument, but you can lose the person, and and, and people have not thought about uh, the image of God in the in the in the individual. They just think of, they just think of the thoughts that I have to destroy, bring every captive thought, uh, every thought captive under Christ. Yes, but you have to bring the people along as well. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and, and one of the things that I emphasize is that we need a holistic apologetic, mm. not simply one that considers the intellectual dimension, but also what about the existential? What about people who struggle with guilt and shame and the fear of death and the need for forgiveness? Uh, what about people who are seeking significance and security? Uh, and also there are people who have a more... Uh, you know, C.S. Lewis, uh, he came to faith because of the use of imagination. Uh, he read the writer George MacDonald, and uh, he came to see the Christian faith uh, looking at it from another angle, um, you know, kind of taking, stepping outside of what he himself believed and was able to envision how things looked from another vantage point. And, and he came to see how this made sense. And, and I think, you know, one, one Christian uh, writer, uh, Louise Cowan, she taught at the uh, University of Dallas, and she came to faith through reading the classics, you know, Dostoevsky and Tolstoy and so forth. She came in, came in, in touch with her own humanity by reading them, and she found that through reading them, the gospel made sense. 
Uh, and so she said it wasn't through rational argument. It wasn't through reading theology textbooks or anything. It was really through literature that she came to see how the Christian faith made sense of the human condition mm. and how it addressed and answered uh, the problem of, uh, of the human condition and the need for forgiveness and reconciliation with God and so forth. So so there are different ways that God can use to speak to us, different, uh, different uh, ways of engaging the gospel, not just intellectually. So we need a more holistic understanding of how God can speak to people's hearts. Uh, apologetics is important. It's neglected, uh, neglected ministry within within local churches, uh, but it's not the only thing going on. We need to be wise about how we engage mm. people with the gospel. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, I think you answered our next, the, the, what was going to be our next question, uh, Dr. Kovpan. That's great. But so I have another one. Uh, so in our, I guess in our uh, one of the reasons why we 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 wanted to to have you on was because um, you know there's certain situations in our in our Latin American context and and uh, and yeah so we we would like to ask you in our in our in our context what yeah. advice would you give for students of apologetics say that are uh, that are um, financial they have financial limitations <laughs> yeah. what what advice would you give the, uh, to them and uh, because one of the things that they'll say well yeah i i want to study apologetics but you know i don't have the resources yeah monetary monetary resources mainly <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 well i mean I, I i know that money uh can be a limitation uh i think perhaps uh, in a Latin context where you have people who have been influenced by apologetics who are in the business world and they see the value of that. Well, I think providing resources for uh, funding for people to do uh, study in apologetics, maybe studying, starting up funding a center for Christian mm -hmm. apologetics in some uh, associated with some sort of institution uh, where people can get good, solid training uh, and they can come and they can come to be part of a uh, you know something greater uh, that has been supported by a uh, by a work that has been done and it, I think a lot of creativity is uh, is is a, is uh, called for here mm -hmm. uh, where you bring That's together right. people who are uh, have a business sense but who love and appreciate apologetics uh, and can fund something like this or it can be a matter of teaming up with say, an institution here in the United States, perhaps, uh, and bringing apologetics to Latin America through people who are uh, through people who are very much interested in uh, having apologetics uh, in their own context. So, for example, uh, two, uh, you know, a year and a half ago, my wife and I, we went to Colombia, South America, to Armenia, and we, uh, well, we actually, Salento, and we were in uh, we were associated with a uh, Christian and Missionary Alliance uh, Bible school there, and faculty from the School of Ministry here at Palm Beach Atlantic University. We fly down, well, you know, on Spirit Airlines. Mm. Uh, my wife and I went down, and it's a very cheap flight. And then someone took care of our housing while we were in Colombia. And during that entire week, I was giving lectures and apologetics and was, you know, was being translated. Uh, and then other members of our faculty in the School of Ministry have also been coming down. Uh, again, we don't get paid to do this. We just have our flight taken care of and our meal room mm. and board taken care of while we're there. And then we're teaching the entire week. And so basically you can get an entire ministry degree course done through this sort of cycling process. So we'll come down for a week at a time, teach there, and the students get the benefit of, uh, of our lecture notes and everything. And so we are, we've been working together with this uh, seminary or this Bible college or Bible school in, uh, in Colombia to, uh, to, to do this teaching. So, so I think that there may be creative ways in which uh, this can be undertaken. And here, uh, here's an example of one that is taking place in a Latin American setting yes, uh, and uh, has proven very fruitful. And now we're working to get an, uh, get our, an online uh, course going for ministry. It's not apologetics specifically, though it does include uh, a course that I've done in apologetics. Uh, but, but I could envision that sort of a thing happening 
uh, where at, you know at a at a more intentional apologetics level, where uh, where this sort of a thing can be done. So so I would encourage you all to think creatively about how this sort of a thing can be done. Conferring with people who are engaged in apologetics, who would be willing to share their resources and their time uh, in a Latin American setting. And, uh, and and bring some of those resources down uh, to you, uh, you know, wherever you are, to uh, to assist in this way. Well, thank you. That's excellent. Yes. And what our our semi final question would be: In your opinion, what is the place of reason in theology? Well, reason has uh, historically been very important in engaging in the philosophical task. Uh, even in you know one one um, philosopher uh, who taught at Princeton Seminary, Diogenes Allen, he yes. wrote a book in which he said that every major Christian doctrine has been influenced by theological by philosophical categories. And in order to understand theology properly <laughs> and doctrine properly, you'll have to know something about philosophy. Mm -hmm. And Uh, and so it is, you know, it, it, you know, there is a place for uh, reason. Some people pit faith against reason. Uh, some people fit, fit, uh, pit faith against evidence. And it's interesting, you see the scriptures don't do that sort of a thing. They bring them together. Um, it, you know, some people, say, they'll say, look at uh, what Jesus said to Thomas, that, uh, you know, that uh, blessed are you, Uh, blessed are those who have not seen and yet still believe. You know, you've s believed because you've seen, but blessed are those who haven't seen and they still believe. Well, of course, Thomas should have believed his fellow, uh, dis you know, the fellow disciples mm -hmm. uh, who were telling them, we have seen the Lord, and he still refused to believe. Um, and it's interesting, too, that, that in, in John chapter 20, the very next verses say that Jesus performed many other signs. But these signs, these miracles that are related in the Gospel of John, these have been written, this, mm -hmm. ev these evidences, these te testimonies of this, these signs, have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life through his name. There is a connection between the evidences, the signs, and believing. Uh, so these evidences, these signs can lead to belief. But, but, you know, reason is a support in the gospel. It is a support in theology. Um, and uh, the theologian Anselm spoke about a faith-seeking understanding. Yes. Uh, that, that, yes, uh, by having faith, by having our, our minds opened by God, we see things differently than the unbeliever will because we have the Spirit of God. We will see things uh, with, a, with new eyes. But it doesn't mean that we shut faith, uh, shut off uh, reason from in this process. C.S. Lewis said that he believed in Christianity like he believed the sun exists. He says, I believe not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, that the Christian faith brings illumination, and this means engaging the mind. It means engaging reason. Uh, the Christian faith brings illumination. It brings insight. It makes better sense of things than the alternatives. And so we need to uh, see not you know not pit faith uh, against reason, uh, but we see them as friends. And of course, reason serves the role of serves. The gospel uh, it serves theology uh, but again it's not to be seen as an enemy some people quote Martin Luther uh, our friend uh, who uh, who called reason a whore well that's uh, the reason uh, was uh, when it's called a whore or a harlot uh, that is because it is taken to be uh, in a sense uh, you know it, it, it takes the the place of the rule of God, the, mm. the, the, the sovereignty of God and so forth, that it's as though it, it could somehow be independent uh, of God or some other uh, stance that we take. No, we're always going to be exerting uh, faith, uh, and uh, whatever, however we use reason, we're going to be doing reason from a certain pro point of view, a certain perspective, a certain faith perspective or trust perspective, uh, that this is inescapable. Uh, and so the question is, which 
faith perspective, which worldview, which philosophy of life makes the most sense of things. And so we see that the gospel does uh, fit or make better sense than the alternatives. So again, uh, so Martin Luther also said that, um, you know, he liked the philosopher Cicero, for example. Uh, and he uh, and and, uh, and and so he, he drew on philosophical resources. So he wasn't as though he was opposed to philosophy or uh, reason, uh, but it just needed to have its rightful place in the order of yes, things. Yes, yes. Uh, I got think also Tertullian. Tertullian also. Uh, Tertullian also say what that what does Athens have to do with Jerusalem? So. <laughs> Right, and again, he he did, he himself, even though he pitted faith against philosophy, he actually did a lot of philosophizing himself. Yes, so, yes, that's uh, right. So was it wasn't it? as though he somehow uh, was just a, a a blind fideist who just believed and and didn't use reason. No, he he did exerted quite a bit of reasoning in in his uh, in his works. Yes. Was it? Yeah. Well, they used to call they used to call uh, Martin Luther the philosopher. So, uh, the last last question we have it was influenced uh, by Augustine, who was very philosophical in his right. understanding. Oh yeah, absolutely. Our last question, uh, Doctor Copan, is um, given so many excellent apologists out there, you know, Zacharias, yourself, Doctor William Lane Craig, uh, Mike Lacona, Habermas. What does what can a, a student of apologetics bring to the table? Yeah. Well, as Jesus said, you know, the harvest is so plentiful and the laborers mm. are few. Uh, and uh, and apologetics is going to be needful uh, both inside the church and outside the church. And so we need people engaging in apologetics to help remove doubts, uh, to help Christians uh, be reinforced in their faith, to be encouraged in their faith, to uh, not to be subject to corrosive doubting all the time, uh, but to find that through their doubts they can be strengthened in their faith. Uh, and again, not all doubts are intellectual and so forth. And so we need to help people discern which are intellectual doubts and maybe which are emotional doubts where people maybe have certain deeper insecurities that need to be addressed, not simply thinking that it's just a matter of intellectual answers or something. Um, we need more than just high profile apologists. Uh, you know, we need people who are in the workplace to open up doors to the gospel mm. uh, through apologetics, uh, teachers in public schools, people who are involved in business, influencing their colleagues for the gospel. Uh, and sometimes it's a matter of teaming up with uh, with uh, others who are more, more high profile. Uh, when I worked on staff with a church in upstate New York, uh, I hadn't gotten my PhD in philosophy in, apolog in philosophy, and uh, but I was bringing in people like William Lane Craig and J.P. Moreland to our local areas, and they would do debates and public talks and so forth, and and do question and answer time. I think this is all. Uh, this is also very important for us, and even pastors and and church leaders who who believe in the importance of apologetics. I think it's good to uh, maybe even after uh, a service to open up the floor for question and answer times. Um, uh, Tim Keller uh, in New York, uh, New York City, did that very effectively just speaking and then opening up a time for question and answer afterwards. I think this gives people a sense of confidence in the gospel, that the gospel is able to handle these sorts of questions. So so we can do apologetics at all sorts of different levels. There could be all sorts of ways in which we can engage with people. So even if we're not professional apologists, uh, we can engage in the apologetic task. It's, it's needful. It's not the only answer, uh, mm. but it is an important one that it's often neglected. I, I like your answer and, and, and like what uh, 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 the question that I, I told you before we started recording that uh, that I wanted to uh, wanted to ask you about uh, the, this Molinism is taking over in, in, in many yeah, what parts is of, that? Of, of, of Latin America uh, of the Latin American co context um, uh, and, and and some people have taken it some some people have even ditched Calvinism literally and then embraced Molinism in any. Uh, yeah, the the other one that uh, the other also the the other position that believes us uh, that you are totally destroyed after after judgment, uh, the pronunciation An annihilism, annihilism. Yeah. annihilism. So 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 they have ditched Calvinism and they have embraced this these two positions uh and they have uh, in some of their blogs and some facebook posts which are very good people uh they have they're they saying that these if you understand this either analysm annihilism Annihilationism. Annihilationism. Annihilationism and and Molinism, both camps say if you understand this 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 theological position, you the whole Bible will open up. Um, but in this case, I like I like to ask you about Molinism. How would you answer to to to, to that claim, um, Doctor Copen? Yeah. 
Yeah, well, uh, first, uh, you know, uh, what is Molinismo? Uh, what is Molinism? <laughs> uh, uh, what, uh, you know, and, and I think just very briefly, uh, just to summarize it, you know, God, who knows all the alternatives, all the possibilities, if uh, human beings are placed in certain uh, circumstances, God knows what we would do in those circumstances. Uh, and, uh, and, and then... Uh, creates the actual world in which human free choices uh, are not violated but are actually utilized in the fulfilling fulfillment of God's redemptive purposes uh, such that God's uh, purposes are accomplished without overriding uh, or uh, or nullifying uh, genuine uh, robust libertarian uh, mm. human freedom. Uh, and so, for example, when David is at Keilah in 1 Samuel 23, uh, David asks the Lord, he said, if Saul comes to the city, will the men of Keilah turn me over to him? And God says, yes, they will. So if this were to happen, then they would turn you over. And so does David do. He leaves. Yes. <laughs> Dave, Dave, you know, he knows what those men would freely do, and so he leaves. Uh, that's just an example of, uh, you know, and again, you can see this illustrated throughout uh, the, the 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 scriptures. Uh, you know that these counterfactuals, if mm. this had happened, then that would have taken place. Uh, and so, uh, so I think that it, it captures a, a fundamental insight in Scripture. Molinism does, mm. um, and it emphasizes the you know on, a, on the one hand, God knows all the possibilities, mm -hmm. and then you know and what what humans would freely do. That it is up to human beings to make these choices, um, and uh, but that God, uh, knowing how human beings would choose if placed in certain conditions uh, or circumstances, He creates the actual world in which that he, that freedom is uh, not overridden, uh, but yet God's redemptive purposes are accomplished, even using evil choices of human beings, like the mm -hmm. crucifixion of Christ, uh, to bring about his redemptive purposes, uh, again, carried out by free moral agents. Um, so, so again, I would see that this is the, the fundamental picture here. I think it brings light. I think it brings illumination as we read portions of Scripture. But to say the entire gospel hangs on this, I think is uh, is is, is stating it way too, uh, you know, is, is overstating it way too much. And so, so I would I would just pull back on those sorts of assertions. I think it does bring insight when it comes to mm. salvation, when it comes to issues of sovereignty and human freedom and so forth. But people can still be faithful followers of Jesus yes. Christ, not holding to Molinism. Uh, they can be uh, they can uh, be wonderful evangelists. They can do great work in the church uh, before. Uh, Luis de Molina came on the scene. People mm. were uh, faithful followers of Jesus Christ, obviously, um, and they, you know, even though they didn't have this way of seeing the bigger picture, uh, and and you know, certainly wrestling with certain tensions, uh, they still faithfully carried out God's work, and uh, and God was well pleased with them. Uh, and so, let's make sure that we keep the the picture uh, in its proper perspective, and not make a certain model. Uh, for understanding divine sovereignty and human responsibility. Let's not make sure that we don't make this the the overarching picture that you can't be a Christian unless you believe in Molinism or something like that. Mm. People do that with Calvinism and so on. Yes, yes. Uh, I think these sorts of things can be very, uh, very dangerous, very divisive. Uh, and I think we need to have, a, a, I think, a, a more generous um, understanding of, of, of how God works and of how God puts up with all of us uh, yes. despite our doctrinal limitations. Mm -hmm. That's a great answer. Okay, <laughs> that is a great answer. Yeah, yes. and, yeah, and it's a, uh, it's it's becoming a, a divisive issue, uh, and that's one of the reasons why why we we uh, we 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 came up with this question. Actually, Luis came up with this question uh, because it, it has you know it's uh, we we could be a little crazy our Latinos you know <laughs> as Latinos. <laughs> so uh, sometimes we need to get a grip of on on reality. You know what I mean. So, well, yeah, yeah, that's all. That's all I have. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I appreciate the time and yes. and uh, it's it's a great opportunity to have you and uh, to meet you. Um, I I will probably uh, see you in November at the uh, Evangelical Theological Society if you if you're planning on going. Yes. Uh, I have, uh, it's San Diego this time, so yes. Okay, sounds <laughs> good. Yeah, yeah. 
I'm, I'm yeah. going to I'm going to be there myself. So. Well, is there okay. any, is there any any way uh, if if people want to contact you or, or know more about Paul Copen, uh, is there any way to contact you, Doctor Copen? Uh, can you give us a plug? <laughs> yeah, well, well, I appreciate Your home, that. Home address, so we no. can go and then. Yes, visit come and visit. Oh, okay. Come join us for pancakes <laughs> on Saturday morning. No. Um, <laughs> The um, you know, if you want to look, my website is paulcopan.com, and people can you know and, and have contacted me through that. Uh, also, I post regularly at Facebook. I have an official Facebook page, and uh, and so I'm often posting on what I'm doing, projects I'm working on, uh, places where I'm speaking, and so forth. So that gives a little bit more of a uh, picture of uh, of what I'm up to. Any plans to coming down okay. to Australia? Have you been to Australia uh, before? <laughs> well. You have not because you ask not. Uh, okay, okay. Well, <laughs> to, I'll see what I can set do. That up. <laughs> Haven't been to Australia, but would love to come. I'll see what I can do. <laughs> All right. Thank Sounds you for your great. time, Dr. Copen. It's, it's, re it's you, been Dr. really Copen. great. Thank you for, for being available to us. It's, it's, you, it's, it's very early in, the, in, in Florida. It's even earlier in California. And here in Australia, it's 10 o'clock um, uh, at night, Monday. So I'd like you to thank you and thank you, Jose, too, also for waking up so early and, and missing some work so we can. Yeah. Well, I'm, actually, this. I'm actually at work. I got to I got to oh. go back. <laughs> OK, OK. All right. Thank well, you very much. Well, good and... to be with both of you, gentlemen. OK, thank you. Thank you. Thank God bless you. you. Gracias. Okay. Gracias. Adios. Bye. Gracias.